All right, we're going to do that introduction one more time. Welcome to the, no, the Collaboration and Conflict webinar presented by the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, United Way of Central New Mexico. Special thanks to U.S. Bank for sponsoring this webinar. I'm pleased to introduce Mark Bennett, Decision Resources, Inc. Mark is a professional mediator and organization consultant who has worked with local, regional, and international nonprofit organizations to help them build cultures of collaboration. Hello everyone. I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you for attending this webinar. Collaboration it rarely involves an alignment of needs and motivations that's so harmonious there's no need to work out differences. Healthy collaboration depends upon the ability to harness differences in perspective, experience, values, priorities, and motivations, like ecosystems that remain healthy and sustainable when there's variety, human organizations depend upon differences. And yet many of us have experiences where unmanaged differences become a negative force. In some cases, this force can become so powerful that it destroys. The power of our prior experiences with conflict and differences leave many of us ambivalent and tentative when strong differences emerge. Then we lack the skills and the confidence to embrace conflict and turn these differences into strength. Today you will learn to think more deeply and clearly about this essential aspect of collaboration, managing and building differences, managing and bridging differences through collaborative negotiation by using a practical roadmap to reach durable agreements. And you will also learn what a 12th century Swiss mystic, President Jimmy Carter, and a retired Midwestern cardiologist have in common. You can help me help you by bringing to mind specific situations in your past, present, or future uh, that you can use to apply this, the ideas that I'm presenting. I encourage you to ask me questions about the practical use of what you are hearing today. Let's turn to the definition of collaboration that I presented at the first webinar in this series. <clears throat> Obviously, it involves a coming together and, and individuals, groups, and organizations. But the key to thinking about collaboration is that it's fundamentally about reaching for something and bringing it into reality that cannot be done without this joint work and effort. Uh, we must continue to remind ourselves why collaborate, to enable something to occur that cannot happen without cooperative engagement. Collaboration is the current reality of the old phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Today we'll look more carefully at two of the cornerstone practices that create this reality. But before we do that, all of the practices presented in this series are responsive to the essential characteristics of collaboration. So I want to summarize them briefly. The first is that fundamentally there is a need for uh, working together. There is a sense of interdependence. Second differences, and this is very important today in the presentation, are acknowledged and embraced. Uh, third, there is a need to work towards agreements that bring and keep people together. So you can think of that as a kind of consensus, that there's general broad agreement that can be sustained over time, even while working with differences. Fourth, there is shared responsibility, that the ongoing practical work and the hygiene, if you will, of people working together is everybody's responsibility to keep it clean, to keep it productive, to keep it constructive. And finally, and this is very uh, uh, relevant to what we're talking about today, constructive behavioral approaches to all aspects of the collaborative effort are predictable. So these practices that I'm going to be talking about today 
uh, dialogue and collaborative negotiation are fundamentally important in order to uh, take the differences that we've talked about and turn them into assets. The asset of diversity comes with a price. To embrace differences, we must also must be able to manage them when it's not easy, when tension, disagreement, and degrees of conflict arise. But that's what we need for mission success. Why are differences so challenging to the ability to collaborate? Well, in this simple depiction of two people today is the metaphor for what we can think about in a more complex way within groups and other settings. Communication is naturally complicated. Many of us have experience with something called the telephone game. It's a simple game where one person whispers in the ear of a person next to them in a circle and a message travels around the circle to come back to the original speaker. By the time a message usually goes through two or three people, it has been transposed and changed in ways that make it seem like it has no resemblance to what the speaker's original intent and communication was. So what we have to be able to do is recognize that fundamentally differences and the work to embrace them have to do with improving and attending to communication. <clears throat> the natural breakdown into misunderstanding and all that comes with it is, is the tendency that will always be present and regrettably in conflict this natural tendency becomes more uh, likely to happen. The emotional intensity of differences and the reactive behavior that comes when people feel at odds with others uh, triggers the natural kind of behavior that in our society in North America we have. The linguist Deborah, Deborah Tannen calls it the argument culture. We swim in it. It's a tendency to debate rather than dialogue and to characterize often negatively people on the other side of disagreements and debates from us. When differences emerge and emotions run high, our behavior often devolves into argument, defensiveness, personal attacks, mockery, and other forms of incivility. So what do you need to do and help others do to respond to this predictable challenge? Well, the good news is you don't need to be able to do what this athletic uh, woman on the screen is doing. But the image of her yoga pose is a good illustration of some qualities that we do need to bring to bear if we're going to be successful in embracing conflict and differences. Uh, the human equation of collaboration across differences calls upon your capacity to act according to what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of your nature and to reach out to the same aspects of others, the better parts of them in the midst of tension and difficulty. Too often, conflict devolves into us operating from the lesser parts of who we are and bringing out that same kind of reaction from other people. So the key to success is response instead of reaction. The more common behavior is instinctive and reactive, and in order to bring a response that has intelligence and consideration forward, you need to maintain the three qualities dramatized on this slide. First, you need to remain calm inside yourself to have that sense of centeredness. The second is you need to remember what you're trying to focus on in the midst of a difficult conversation and not be pulled off focus into distractions and areas that are not going to be productive. Concentrate on what is positive and productive. And third is flexibility. You also have to be able to respond in a in a, an appropriate way to what's going on in the moment and adapt your response to the needs of the situation. Relatively easy to state, but not so easy to do when we're in the midst of it. So with these qualities and with some knowledge of the dimensions of collaborative negotiation that I'm going to share with you today, effective, inspired responses are possible. 
So I want to go through this simple star structure with you to give you a sense of the landscape of what collaborative ne negotiation really is. At the bottom of the star, there are two foundation elements, purpose and principle. So fundamentally, we need to understand what our direction is and what we're trying to accomplish. And secondly, we need to have a sense of our own best self, uh, what I mentioned that Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. What are my principles? What am I going to hold true to in the way that I treat others and that the way that I comport myself and the way that I make my decisions? When you know what your purpose is and what principle or principles that you really want to embody and carry out. You have a strong foundation to think down the road towards what might be possible. What do you really hope to accomplish here? Uh, what might it look like? What inspires you to make the effort to try and work out these differences? So when you have that tension between where you are with your purpose and your principles and the possibility that you're oriented towards, then you can begin to, to do the very important but sometimes difficult work of walking the path forward with the, your counterparts on the other side of this conflict and also maintaining a process of engagement that's going to keep the kind of conversation and dialogue going long enough to find a way forward together. So going back over all these in a slightly different way, Purpose sets the direction. Principle aligns you with the kind of behavior and the kind of aspirations that you hold for your own conduct. Possibility enables that creative force to come forward in the encounter as you think about what might be possible together. Path gives you the focus that you're going to need to stay productive and engaged and process enables a containment of some of the reactive forces and the negative things that could emerge in a conflict that could undermine the whole effort. So we're going to look at these dimensions now in a slightly different way using a story. It's a story from the 12th century in Switzerland. And there was a man named Nicholas von Flew who had a reputation in the region where he lived of wisdom and piety and simplicity. He was often sought by people in times of difficulty for advice and counsel. There was a time in Swiss history that there was no existing federation or unification that existed in the country. It was separated into what it are called its current cantons, but they were all like neighboring tribes. They had wars, they had difficulties, they distrusted each other. So in this particular moment in Swiss history, two of these neighboring cantons were about ready to go to war. And the people of the villages and towns in these areas beseeched their military leaders to seek out the guidance of Nicholas von Flew. And the people uh, uh, convinced them to make a pilgrimage to his distant hermitage in the Swiss mountains. So when they got there, Nicholas von Flew emerged, and after he heard their complaints and their blame and their anger towards each other, their accusations, he simply took off his rope belt and he handed it to them. He looked at them and he said, tie this in a knot. This was not the response they were looking for, but with some awkwardness, they began to work together to handle the rope and they tied it in a knot. Then he said, Pull as hard as you can on one end of the rope. And each of them took an end of the rope and pulled on it. He looked at them again and said, what has happened? They said, well, the knot has become very tight. He looked at them and he said, untie the knot. And then they realized that in order to do that, they first had to release the tension with which they were holding the rope. Then they began to explore the knot together with their fingers to find the place where they could begin to unjam it and then completely unravel the knot. He held out his hand for the rope. He said, give me the rope back. They gave it to him and he said, thus will your dispute be resolved. And he walked away from them. In Swiss history, those words 
And that encounter between those two people and Nicholas von Flew is credited with averting a war that led to the foundation agreement that has become the cornerstone document of modern day Switzerland. Switzerland is a geopolitical example of collaboration. They have no unified ethnic identity. They have four official languages in their country, but they have a, a centuries old history of stability. They have remained neutral in other wars that have taken place all around them. They have become an active force for peace building in the world and are an international center for organizations, organizations and people in conflict to come and seek peace together. A journey of this country began with the untying of a, of a knot and a rope. Now I want to show you a map of the path that you can follow and we'll continue to think about this knot and the untying of it <clears throat> in every negotiation, in every conflict, to build collaboration, to work out serious differences, and to keep collaboration strong. <clears throat> if you're thinking of collaboration, the outcome that you're always after is not just a good result not just an agreement that seems fair and makes sense. You're also looking for a process of engagement along the way, along the road, that's going to enable and encourage and support a positive relationship in the future. So this road always begins with people coming together. I call it the table. Whether it's a table or not, you have to find the right time and place for people to come together. In order to do that, you have to think who are the right key and necessary people, where is this going to happen, and when. Once you're at the table, you have to begin to think about the knot. The knot are the issues. They're the issues that have, people have become tied up about and have disagreements about that need to be untangled. So the issues represent the what. What do we talk about? What do we have to resolve? Once the what is clear, there needs to be an unpacking of the interests that underlie these issues, the things that cause people to care about them and to be motivated to be entangled related to them. The interests form the essential why, why this matters to people, why they care. It's a critical layer to unpack and in many negotiations and conflicts people continue to wrangle about the issues without ever becoming clear why these truly matter to the other people involved. Once the what and the why are clear you've released the tension on the rope. You now are able to really work with the options and manipulate them and consider them in ways to resolve and complete the untying of the knot. So the options represent the how are we going to work this out? How are we going to do this? How might we take care of this? How have other people resolved issues like this that we could follow or consider? So the energy of this momentum on the road can propel you out of difficult circumstances into a durable agreement. So that's the roadmap, and that's the way that the knot gets untied by lessening the tension. It's a series of steps. They're very practical. They have a focus, and they can help you continue to move forward. But every journey begins often with tentative and sometimes challenging steps. So what you have to do at the beginning is help people come together. And when people are feeling very adversarial with each other or mistrustful or there's a history of polarization and difficulty that's set in in the working relationship, this can be a challenge. So you have to be intentional in building the table and getting the table right is a big step. So my second story for you is a true story. There was a city about half the size of Albuquerque in the Midwestern United States with two hospitals who'd been locked in a bitter competitive feud for over a decade. 
when one announced a plan to build a new cancer center and a fundraising campaign to support it, the other would announce an even larger initiative and go after funding from the same sources. When one recruited an eminent neurosurgeon from a neighboring city, the other would either try and poach a senior doctor from the staff of the hospital to steal their thunder of the new uh, doctor arriving, or they would announce their own distinguished hire. When one applied to the hospital regulatory body to add more bed capacity, the other immediately filed a petition to block the approval, and so on. Their actions, actions over the years had resulted in a series of lawsuits, two of which were still pending at the time this story takes place. In the meantime, many health needs in the community that could have used their collaborative and joint efforts remained unmet as their competitive actions drained away their discretionary resources and completely eliminated the possibility of any joint positive action for the public's benefit. They couldn't talk to each other, they didn't talk to each other, and that was the state of affairs. With the lobbying of the mayor's office and other prominent citizens who were tired of this kind of negative competitive environment between the hospitals, a prominent retired cardiologist agreed to intervene. He had good relationships with key people at both hospitals on the boards of directors and the senior medical staff, and he worked diligently for months to convene a summit conference that was carefully planned and held to explore ways to end the, the conflict and to begin to act for the benefit of the community. Over a series of months, meetings took place but it started with a table that was carefully built for the meetings that were there with the right people, with agreements and understandings about whether the press was going to be involved, about whether there was going to be public comment. All of this was necessary to end a feud that had had a grip on this community and these organizations for over a decade. It ended with a remarkable announcement of a series of joint collaborative initiatives. A fundraising campaign co-chaired by the presidents of both hospitals, along with other prominent citizens, to support a group of low-income health clinics to meet the most pressing needs of the, the, the poorest of the people in this community a mobile van co-sponsored by both hospitals that would do immunizations and other public health screenings in the metro area, a commitment to work with the mayor and advocates for health care for the poor to do a first ever comprehensive survey of the community to determine the highest priority unmet health needs that could form the basis for a joint future plan between the hospitals with other key health care providers in the community. Building the right kind of table was a huge step that led towards these positive changes. I want to give you a simple, powerful way to prepare for collaborative negotiation. So this image of a poker hand we would all love to hold is one I hope you will be able to remember and key you back into the, the essential parts of good preparation. Careful preparation, like many things in life, is the key to success in collaborative negotiation. So the first thing is the location in time and place with the right people. It's critical. So think place. Then think space. What kind of a conversational environment is going to be needed for the crucial engagement that you need between people? It's constructive, and the, the, the conversations are more likely to bear fruit because what you've done to begin to choreograph and construct the space that they need to have these conversations. The third thing is a sense of order and clarity about the movement through the issues that's going to maintain a focus. You can't deal with everything at once. What are you going to deal with first? Uh, what's going to build momentum that helps you tackle tougher issues? What kind of organization of these agendas is going to really help move forward? And the last thing is something that goes far beyond what we tend to think of as an Eastern or an Asian concern about saving face. The, the idea that people are going to be exposed or embarrassed psychologically is a tremendous fear. 
And sometimes people will not even come into settings like this to begin to try and work through their differences because they're concerned about how they'll look in the eyes of others. So it's important to pay particular attention to the ongoing need to keep participants non-reactive, non-defensive, and non-aggressive with each other. So you can easily create a planning diagram that takes this image of the four aces and puts it on a pad. It can be a pad in front of you in a notebook. It could be a whiteboard if you're doing this with people to think about bringing a group of people together to collaborate and work out a conflict. Or it could, could be in a computer program, in a Microsoft Word document. So you take the four aces and you put them in the four quadrants. And so you begin to make notes about what needs to take place in order to build the table and come together. So the neutrality of the, space, the, the place that you're going to come together is important. Are people going to be comfortable there? Are they going to not feel that, or are they going to feel that it doesn't favor anybody in particular? Is the necessary privacy available? And finally, is it going to be convenient? Is it going to be comfortable? Is it going to give people a relaxed atmosphere? Formal boardroom tables often don't do the job. So you have to think about the configuration of the room. Think about simple things like refreshments and things that can make people feel comfortable. They may seem small, but they all add up. With space, you want to think about how it's going to begin with a positive tone. When the Hospital Wars participants came to the table, the mayor stood up and welcomed them and thanked them and appreciated them for their willingness to work together to try and help the community. A tone is set by the first words that are spoken. A tone is set by having someone there who can manage the meeting and the dynamics, who can call people back to the positive purposes when they get stuck and when behavior may start to degrade. You may need a facilitator or a mediator as this retired cardiologist who had everyone's respect. He wasn't a professional mediator, but he was someone with wisdom, common sense, and great experience who had the respect of the parties. You may need to set guidelines about behaviors, about the kinds of things that are going to be expected of people. Are people going to walk out of the meeting and immediately give um, give comments to somebody about an article that's going to run in the paper about what happened in the meeting or things going to be held private. Those are important understandings. And finally, as I've mentioned before, this issue of coming back to constructive behavior. Very few of these, when there are real difficulties, are going to go smoothly from the beginning. It's easy for people to become argumentative. It's easy for people to become defensive. It's easy for personal attacks to be lodged across the table. So how are people going to be called back to the better angels of their nature? With PACE, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to have a focused agenda. People don't like surprises. It's often in these difficult meetings, it's people often want to come knowing what's going to be discussed and in what order. So to develop a clear agenda can be important, and then to sequence it so you often work with more doable and manageable issues first, working towards the thorniest and the more difficult ones. So the careful sequencing of the issues can be important. And it's all also important to know when to take a break, to know when to adjourn, to know when people at the table are going to need to talk with each other and confer, sometimes adversaries, sometimes people who are more allies. Those kinds of side, away from the table conversations during breaks can be very powerful in helping a process move forward. And finally, with face, I like to think of it as an image of having a room without corners. And now, obviously, you're going to be in a room that has physical corners, but how do you help people keep from feeling cornered or backed into a corner? That's very important. And then this issue of no frills respect is really fundamentally uh, essential to the success of this process. When you're working with people who do not at this moment in time actually respect each other, you have to find a way to help them see that even without that respect, they can still extend respect 
basic respect to another human being. And that's a fundamental uh, element to have in place in order to have the kind of discussions that are necessary. All that allows people to know that this is a place, even with differences, even potentially with strong disagreements, that their dignity is preserved and acknowledged. So I hope you will use this four-square analysis as a way to think about setting up your important collaborative encounters for success when there are differences and conflicts that have to be worked out. So when you're ready at the table, what must you do next? So the table is the first step, but it's not really the foundation for the conversation. It's critical, but then think of your initial work within the meeting as laying the right foundation before you talk about options or possibilities. You have to lay the foundation to do that in a successful way. You have to move the conversation from a debate about the problem and who's responsible for it and how it should be solved to a broader inquiry into the aspects of the problem. And you do that by putting those big rocks in place at the beginning that are going to hold up the work that you're going to do to create something. So those issues that I talked about that define the problem and clarify the aspects of it have to be understood and and laid out for people. Then you begin to explore those by also talking about what people's underlying interests are, that critical why. Um, the, you simultaneously, while you're laying out the issues and exploring the interests, you're simultaneously developing greater understanding and creating the conditions for an inquiry that's going to lead you towards possibility. And as unlikely as it may seem, just as with the hospital wars people, if you'd had people bet on whether the people who'd been suing each other vigorously for over a decade and wouldn't even talk together, if they could come together and sit in the same room and work out the kind of agreements that resulted from, from that collaborative negotiation, people would have bet against you. It may have looked unlikely, like this... Uh, this uh, dust-colored rock at the top of this uh, image, but it was built, and it was built by laying the right foundation and working very carefully and steadily towards something that very few people probably thought would be possible. So you've been looking at the steps on the path that mark the way forward. We've talked about the foundation that you need to lay that help you move forward on the path, but you need effective process, as I mentioned when I talked about the dimensions of collaboration. Process contains behavior and it keeps it positive. It shapes the constructive behavior that's essential. Otherwise, behavior can derail any attempt at collaborative negotiation. Then with good behavior, or I should say constructive behavior, you stay on the path to durable agreement. So effective process begins with better listening. Sounds simple, but most of us know that it can be difficult to listen to people with whom we have serious differences. When people begin to listen more than they speak, things shift in a good way. You know, there are proverbs that are found in cultures all across the world about listening. They usually go something like this. You were given one mouth and two ears, nature's way of saying, speak little, listen much. So that's a wisdom that exists in the United States. It exists in other parts of the world. The same proverb, it's only phrased differently, but the same idea that we should listen more than we speak. So it becomes easier to learn together in a new kind of environment conversation that does more than recycle familiar uh, arguments and disagreements. So this understanding that's critical can grow when we listen more. Another thing that happens is there's a space within listening that allows ideas to emerge. It's natural. It's not forced. The third thing that I've noticed very particularly in working with groups, and I, I convene processes for many groups 
larger groups of anywhere from six to to 25 in a room trying to work out collaborative issues and differences is that when you increase the listening in the room, there's more opportunity for the quiet voices, people that will tend to hang back in group settings and not contribute or feel crowded out by other more dominant voices who have plenty to say and are not bashful about doing it. You can hear the quiet voices. There's sometimes great wisdom and wonderful ideas from people who don't tend to be the more vocal folks. So this listening environment is really fundamentally important in order to maximize the potential for this conversation. When a climate of listening allows dialogue to emerge, it's the quality of the questions that actually drives and propels the conversation forward. There are certain kinds of com questions that shut other people down and that lead to distraction and they're the kinds of questions that open doors. So more understanding and the progress that goes with it requires open, honest questions. So an open question is something that when I pose it as a questioner, it really puts the ball in the speaker's lap and lets them do what they want with it. I'm not moving them in any particular direction. I'm giving them the opportunity to tell me what they want to tell me. They can answer in their own way. An honest question is one that is designed only to learn, not to do other things like expose, put someone on the spot, make them look bad in front of others, um, let them know that you think that they're wrong or stupid uh, or uh, that they don't have a leg to stand on in the arguments or the points that they've been making. So without any other agenda but learning, that's an honest question. I ask it because I want to know the answer. There was a movie mogul named Samuel Goldwyn who once said, for your information, let me ask you a few questions. And that's another agenda that's away from honesty, when I'm trying to teach somebody something through the form of questioning them. It's, there's nothing wrong when doing that in a classroom, but when you're trying to work with somebody in collaboration, you're working on the same level with them, not being above them as a teacher and using your questions to help point out the inferiority or the inadequacy of their thinking. So let's consider some examples of the kind of open and honest questions that open doors of possibility. So this kind of a question goes right to that layer of importance. I call it the heart of the matter. So think about the kind of question that you might ask that would ask people to tell you what's essentially important to them and then pay close attention to what they tell you. Another kind of question that would open doors would be to go beyond the people who are directly involved and ask about other stakeholders who might be impacted by what we're talking about here today. That that's a very fruitful and a very moral question to ask. Who else should we consider and think about? who's going to be uh, touched by what, what we're talking about. There's nothing wrong with interjecting in a very even-handed and an open way the question of fairness. And it's particularly powerful when you think about fairness to other people who are not represented there in the room. So this is a question to really think about not only the impact on people, but the whole question of what would fairness represent in this situation. Another aspect of fairness, which is a critical issue for us when we negotiate with people and we're trying to find something that's going to work for us, is when somebody makes a proposal to you, ask them to speak about how they think of that as fair from your perspective, not only from theirs. Obviously, they made the proposal on their own behalf. But this is another way to interject fairness into the conversation. The last example I'll give you, and there are many more that I could, could give you, is what happens in conflict is people tend to overfocus on what we disagree about. The intensity of our disagreement becomes an energetic force that draws us to focus on that and to feel the, the difficulty of it. And often what's left out uh, is any attention to what you might agree about, uh, whether it's implied or explicit. 
So this question is, is a good one to find out where people tend to see or think about common ground and where it might be without, uh, without minimizing your disagreements, which you still have to deal with. When we look at disagreements in tandem with agreements, they often uh, seem different. You know, it's, it's kind of the glass is half full and half empty, and that's a way to look at disagreement and difficulty that can change things. So on the other side of good questions is another process tool that uh, contains misunderstanding and reactivity while focusing the discussion forward. Um, this process tool is called looping. So there are two elements of it, acknowledgement and completing a sense of understanding. So we have an ongoing problem in conflict with what people in the early days of radio called the signal-noise ratio. So if you can think of an old-time radio set and hearing a crackly voice coming through uh, the speaker, and you can barely hear it sometimes, and sometimes the static gets bigger and you adjust the dial to try and reduce the static, that represents the signal-noise ratio. The signal is the clear message in the words, and the static is the noise that interferes with people's ability to understand the signal. What happens in conflict is the static of people's inner thoughts, their feelings, their sense of fear and anxiety sometimes, their anger, all override their ability to receive the signal that's coming through. So when somebody is saying something to me, I'm not hearing them. I may hear what I want to hear, I may think I've heard them, but I'm really wrapped up in my own process. So we have to break that cycle in the midst of conflict and differences by completing the loop of understanding. It's the gold standard to confirm accuracy in communication. A loop is a short summary of your understanding, you the listener, of what the speaker is trying to communicate to you. Because people try and communicate in a variety of ways. They do it with voice tone, they do it with feelings, and they do it with words, and they do it with other nonverbal language that they're, they're using to send their message to you. So I could be getting the sense of what somebody is telling me um, very differently depending on how it's conveyed. Somebody could say to me, Mark, that's wrong, and that would be one, one message for me to receive. But if somebody sent those same two words to me with scorn and contempt in their voice, they would be sending a message to me that's very different. And I could internalize that of them calling me stupid or them disrespecting me, and that could lead to an entirely different response than when somebody says, Mark, that's wrong in which I might say, well, tell me why you think so. That's a whole different conversation than my angry response to something that I feel is being disrespectful to me. So this loop is your way or my way of saying, this is what I'm understanding you're telling me. Is that right? I want to make sure I've got your key point. I heard you say two things. Did I miss something? All those are ways to complete the loop and there, what's essential is to um, whoop, went back. To, to complete the loop, what we need to do is make an effort to make sure we're not misunderstanding, first of all, and then to go beyond that to increase the clarity of our understanding, and finally to act in a way through the way that I'm listening to you and showing you that I'm carefully listening to you and trying to understand to promote a positive climate that's going to serve us as we continue to try and move forward together. Uh, the other thing that's not on this slide, and it's something that's very important and it's pragmatic for you when you're in a situation with differences with other people, is that looping and feeding back in your own words very simply what you're hearing and finding out if if that's correct for the speaker, gives you time. It buys you time to think more, to hear more from them, 
and to then continue to formulate and consider how you're going to handle the situation and try and move it forward in a good way. So let me give you some uh, final guidelines about looping because it is not a formula. It is not a formula. It's not a technique. It is a common sense way to confirm understanding. And you're trying to seek to understand before you open your mouth and give your response to what the speaker just said. So that, you un that you're responding then to what he or she intended or can confirm to you they wanted to say to you, and you can develop a skillful response. So it's very important to monitor your own internal barriers, the kind of inner judgments and rehearsing and distractions that we're all, we're all prone to. They are so common. The most common one is in the middle of that second line, rehearsing. What, ha what is happening in differences and conflict for many people is that they're hearing the speaker talk, they're beginning to formulate their response to explain why the speaker's wrong, about where I disagree with you, and they're not fully listening to what's being said. So the looping as a discipline helps you avoid that common trap. You're reflecting back your understanding, and it may in a given situation be the facts that you've heard. It may have to do with the feelings that are being expressed to you, or it may have to do with some underlying assumptions that seem to be implied in what the speaker's saying that you want to find out if they really are assuming that, or some other concern that they have. Anything that seems substantively important is fair game for an, a respectful feeding back to make sure that the speaker and you are on the same page. Finally, it's critically important to allow wait time when you, when you loop back to get confirmation or correction from the person about whether you've understood them correctly. Then that opens up the next round of the communication. Again, it's not a technique, and it's certainly not parroting back and using the exact words that somebody is using to you. Uh, which often is very irritating to people. When it's done simply and honestly and sincerely, it works, and it's not a technique. So with open questions and looping, you can begin to establish the bridge between you and them. But you have to be able not only to walk on to the bridge, but to join in the middle. It's that moving towards agreement that we're thinking about here. You need a common language so you can fully explore durable agreement. The common language, I've mentioned the word before, but it's so important, we're going to talk about it in a little more detail, are the interests that underlie the issues. The fundamental why does this matter to you, to them, to the community stakeholders around the issue, to understand that why and to talk about it requires talking specifically about what we value and also what we need. So the, the language of values and needs brings those interests and motivations alive. Um, there's a simple tool that I want to give you that will help you take this fluency, which all of us have, but to bring it to a more conscious level in conflict and difficult situations to speak this common language. So there are two parts to it. Uh, we learn to speak the, the language of values and needs in conflict and in collaborative negotiation by identifying first ours, yours, and others, other stakeholders. Then we can discuss and relate and strategize about these interests in very tangible and practical ways. <clears throat> there are only three categories of, of interests that will emerge in any conflict, whether it's here or in another country. And there are shared interests, complementary interests, and conflicting interests. Complementary interests are those that, that don't, they're just different. They don't necessarily conflict. Shared interests obviously, obviously are those that are common interests and conflicting are those that we might call zero sum. They're the kind of interests where if I give you more of what we're talking about, I get less. More for you is less for me. And there's a sense of complete win-lose about the resolution of them. So 
Um, I want to now tell you the third story that I have in this webinar um, that, that, that is uh, a way to tie this all together. Uh, Jimmy Carter convened Egyptians and Israelis at Camp David in um, the late 70s to work out a very difficult uh, conflict that had been preceded by a number of wars. And the parties had a strong common interest that they could build upon. And that was that if there was an agreement, they were both going to get a lot of money from the United States. So it was a strong common interest in their own economic security that would be met by an agreement. They also uh, weren't so sure initially about what their complementary interests are, so I'm going to come back to that. But they had some significant uh, conflicting interests that they were trying to compromise. And the major one had to do with the territory in the Sinai Peninsula, which Israel had won from Egypt uh, during uh, the last of their, their series of wars. And the bargaining was all about how much or how little of that Israel was going to give back to Egypt. And Egypt wanted it all, and Israel didn't want to give back any of it. So it was a classic negotiation over a conflicting interest in territory and a fixed pie, more for you is less for me. But Carter and his team skillfully helped the Egyptians and the Israelis move into the center part of this diagram by realizing that their interests over the Sinai Peninsula were not conflicting because Israel wanted all that territory for their physical security. They wanted military and a potentially threatening nation to be as far away from their actual border as possible. And Egypt wanted it for national pride, a sense of sovereignty, and uh, a sense of restoring their own dignity because they'd lost the, the, the previous war in a remarkably humiliating and, and kind of um, powerful way. They'd been de defeated so completely and convincingly so quickly, and they thought that they had a vaunted military, and they went into it with all kinds of aspirations about what was going to happen, and they were, they were essentially smashed. So they were still dealing with their own psychological uh, wounds over the way that, that the war had ended. So with security versus uh, sovereignty, they were able to combine an agreement that gave uh, Egypt all of the Sinai Peninsula. Egyptian sovereignty was restored, but there were demilitarized zones that were very carefully choreographed close to Israel. There were all kinds of other special protections and innovative ideas that kept the Egyptian military far away from Israel and met all of Israel's security needs. That's been one of the few durable bright spots in peace in the Middle East. Uh, and it was built on a powerful way of looking at interests, understanding them, and, and developing an agreement that blended the interests by dovetailing these uh, complementary interests and not seeing them as conflicting when they didn't have to be. So although collaboration and the concept of collective impact is now in fashion, it is in fact an old part of the human story that reflects deep wisdom for a Swiss mystic, a U.S. president, and a retired cardiologist. It is a road. People in different parts of the world with very different backgrounds without formal education know how to travel this road, and so do people of great sophistication. The path is the same. It's known, and it applies to the challenges that you face to bridge differences and reach durable agreements that sustain collaboration. So the cornerstone practices that I've talked about today are the first two on this diagram, dialogue and collaborative negotiation. The success to collaboration is, as I believe I said earlier in life, the same as in life to follow through. You need to take what you find useful in this presentation today and practical and integrate it into your work to create and sustain collaboration. There are a few key things that you can do. Um, one of the things that you can do is look at your own difficulties and anxieties about dealing with conflict directly and develop what I call your collaborative negotiating muscle. Um, the second thing is when things get sticky, as they often do in negotiation, um, you can go back to a sense of what is really important to you, your core values and guiding principles, those better angels of your nature, and be clear what's motivating you and what your purpose is. And then you can always, always use the roadmap 
to stay on the path. So um, there's a question that I have from you, and there's time for any of you to send in questions if you like. The first question is, I'm not comfortable with conflict. What can I do to change that? So um, I have an, an honest answer to you, but it's not the answer that you want. Um, there's a famous uh, saying about, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice, practice, practice. So when you're not comfortable with conflict, what you have to do, because none of us can play Rachmaninoff without a lot of practice, we can't tackle bigger, more complicated things, we have to start with little things. So look around you in your life and all the daily opportunities that you have with a coworker, with your children at home, you know, with your spouse or partner, to work on those differences. And when that little irritating thing comes up, instead of not dealing with it, practice bringing it up and working it through. So uh, from little acorns, big oak trees grow. Okay, the second question is, how can I negotiate with someone who seems to have a hidden agenda or someone who refuses to engage? So those are both challenging situations. Let's take, talk about the hidden agenda first. I talked earlier with you about that idea about uh, allowing people not to feel cornered. And sometimes, you know, we may just want to take that on directly with people, but there's often a more skillful way. And to take people at face value, but also to point out to them inconsistencies is a way to work with a hidden agenda. So let me give you an example. So if I think somebody is saying that they really want to work out a collaboration with me, but they have some other reason for being in the room and they don't really want to do that, I might say to them, so John, I'm not really understanding why collaborating with us is in your best interest. Help me see that, because I'm, I'm not sensing from you that, that you're necessarily as interested as we are in doing this. Could you talk about that? So that gives him an opportunity to talk more with me about what his agenda is and for me to read that with him, because I may not believe him. He might not tell me the truth. But I try and take on a hidden agenda sort of slightly indirectly, but put it on the table and talk about it in the, in the sense of this is only going to work, John, if we both got a high level of motivation to make it work. So I believe that uh, it's right for you to be convinced of my motivation, and I need to be convinced of yours, so let's talk about that. And so put that issue of our agendas on the table. With engagement, um, I told you the story of the cardiologist in the Midwest. He spent months getting people who didn't want to engage to agree to engage. Now, that was a very polarized situation. But engagement is critical. People have to be willing to come to the table. And as if you're wanting somebody to come to the table, then what you need to be able to do is speak directly to why is it in their interest to come to the table and find out from them what would make it worth their while to come to the table and engage. So engagement is critical because it precedes everything else that we've been talking about. So I have, I just need to wrap up now with a couple, we have one more question that's coming in, but why don't I, cover a little more information with you while I'm waiting for that question. Uh, the first thing that I want to let you know is that I continue to be available for your questions. I'm glad you were interested in the seminar today, and I have my contact information here on the screen. I welcome you giving me a call or emailing me. And there are a couple of resources that I find particularly powerful that I put up here for you to take a look at. Uh, and finally, at the bottom of this list of resources on the screen, there is a comprehensive list uh, at the website for the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, so I encourage you to go there and, uh, and examine what you find. So I, the last question I have before we need to close is how do you deal with two parties who are particularly hostile to each other? Do you try to resolve the difficulty first? Um, you know, one of the things, uh, if, if the hostility level is really great, people may not be able to contain themselves and move into behavior that's, that's minimally constructive. So uh, there are a couple ways that can do, one, one of the ways is to work as a go-between. Uh, when the U.S. can't talk to Iran, we talk to the Algerians because the Algerians talk to the U.S. and the Algerians talk to the Iranians. And the same thing is true between people. 
you know, if, if Mark can't talk to Betty, but Mark can talk to John, and John gets along great with Betty, then sometimes John needs to play a role here in helping Mark and Betty have their first conversation that's a little more civil. So one of the things to think about is what kind of conversations might take place before trying to bring the two hostile people together. And yes, there may be some difficulties that might be able to be ironed out, but, but relationship and collaboration is a full contact sport. And people who are feeling hostile and are in a collaboration or need to collaborate fundamentally are going to have to come to the table. But it may be that there's some work that someone who has a good relationship with both of them can do first to pave the way for that first meeting. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your participation and for your interest. I remain available uh, as you wish to talk more about any of the things that I've covered today. Thank you again.